Tonight, we are diving into the latest space headlines as the new space race heats up in the 21st century. Specifically, we're going to the moon. India is now the fourth country to land on the moon. They pulled it off last month as other countries are competing to put a manned spacecraft on the moon's south pole. Joining us tonight to dive deeper into this latest race is CBS News space consultant Bill Harwood. Bill, thanks for joining us today. My pleasure to be here. So what do you make of, of all of these recent headlines? For those of us who, who aren't living and breathing all things space, how big of a deal is it, this most recent moon landing? It's a pretty big deal because it kind of symbolizes this new space race that's going on right now. It's very different from the Cold War space race with the Soviet Union. The U.S. won that race, obviously, with the Apollo program. But, uh, but this new effort is focused on the moon's south pole, as you said. And the reason is very simple. They think there is water there in the form of ice in permanently shadowed craters. And if there is ice there, and that's not really clear yet just what form it might be in, but you can take that apart. You get hydrogen, you get oxygen, you got air, you got water, you got rocket fuel. If you don't have to carry all that to the moon with you, it makes it vastly cheaper to explore the solar system. And so there's a huge amount of interest, it's kind of a, a modern day, I'll call it an ice rush on uh, toward the moon to find out if these resources are there and if they can be exploited. So somewhat of a fuel station, a gas station for space that kind of opens up our opportunities. Absolutely, no question about it. And that's what's fueling these, these new missions. I will add one thing. You mentioned India is the fourth country to put a lander on the moon. There's a lot of prestige involved in this. You know, uh, interplanetary exploration is very definitely a superpower pursuit. Uh, being able to put people on the moon is an absolute sign of your superpower status. Uh, China plans to do that. And of course, NASA's planning to return astronauts to the moon later this decade. So all of these nations, do they work completely independently? If someone does discover resources on the moon that we're looking for, wouldn't that knowledge be helpful for all of these space programs or, or is everything kept pretty, pretty secret? Well, you know, that's a really good question. Uh, NASA has a program called the Artemis Accords. Their moon program is called the Artemis Program where they've signed up about 20 other nations uh, that have agreed to kind of a general framework for how to explore the moon. Among those, uh, those guidelines are a free flow of scientific information, uh, et cetera. NASA's concern, according to the administrator Bill Nelson, is that a country like China, for example, could stake out a spot on the moon and say, this is ours. We, we get these resources. We got here first. We found them. Uh, so I don't know how that would play out in the big picture. Uh, but certainly there is cooperation out there. Uh, it's unclear yet how that plays out if these resources are actually found there and what it's going to take to get there. So on that note, what is the takeaway from Russia's failed landing recently? You know, the, the Russians, uh, they were racing the U.S. to the moon back in the 60s and 70s. Uh, they lost out on the Apollo program, but they have sent unpiloted landers to the moon. They have collected lunar samples and returned them back to Earth 50 years ago. Uh, this was considered, I guess, uh, throwing your hat back in the ring and saying, hey, you know, we're here too, and we want to take advantage of these uh, potential findings on the moon as well. This mission didn't work, but there's no question the Russians can do this at some point. Uh, their budgets are a little bit uncertain, so we don't know how that's going to play out. But uh, I, I think they clearly want to remain a player in the space race, I'll call it. Uh, and so we'll have to see what their next steps are going to be. So there have also been some headlines about potentially exploring or studying the sun. What is all of that about? Well, there's, there's ongoing exploration of the sun. You know, NASA and the European Space Agency operate very sophisticated solar spacecraft. Uh, India just launched their first solar spacecraft. Uh, to learn more about the star. That is more of a, a purely scientific pursuit. I'd say it's another sign of superpower prestige, uh, having the wherewithal to mount missions like this. It's not something uh, smaller nations or economies can, can undertake. Uh, but clearly that's a, that's a major objective for, for India as it is ongoing uh, for NASA. But, but the moon is the focus for human exploration. Uh, you know, the, the Chinese plan to have people on the moon by the end of the decade. NASA is doing the same. Uh, India has talked about doing that. Uh, and of course, European Space Agency and other nations are on board with NASA. So that's where the, the real impetus is in the human space program. 
And Bill, is there any connection between climate change here on Earth and the issues we are dealing with as a result of climate change and the search for resources or, or, or the search for anything else in space? Well, certainly a uh, spacecraft like India's solar probe, you know, learning how the sun affects the Earth's environment, that's obviously a, a critical issue in climate change. Uh, but the lunar exploration, really, the resources we're talking about there are, are to help astronauts, future astronauts and cosmonauts and taikonauts, as the Chinese call them, uh, live off the land, if you will. You know, be able to, to build and establish permanent or semi-permanent manned bases on the moon, and then to use the moon as kind of a jumping off point uh, for deep space exploration, maybe future flights to Mars or asteroids. Uh, so I don't, I don't see the moon program as contributing directly to climate change, although the observations you make and the technology you, de you develop for those missions obviously could play a role down the road. And of course, UFOs or UAPs, just the concept of aliens, always getting a lot of attention, and it's a fun conversation to have. Uh, has any of the information come out about that recently? Is there any tie-in with space exploration? Could we learn more about potential life elsewhere? Uh, no, to answer your question, no, not yet. But <laughs> next week, or actually later this week, I should say, uh, NASA's having a briefing to uh, discuss the results of an independent study panel that has been trying to come up with better ways to explore UAPs, or I think what the average person on the street would call a UFO. There certainly are some mystifying observations by military pilots and others that can't be readily explained. And so NASA's got a report that will be out later this week on uh, better ways to perhaps pin down what some of these things might be. But so far, you know, sad to say, uh, no direct evidence of aliens quite yet. <laughs> I think a lot of people would be sad to hear. It's such a fun conversation. Bill Harwood, CBS News Space Consultant Absolutely. in the Kennedy Space Center Bureau. Bill, thanks so much for joining us tonight. We appreciate your insight. My pleasure. Well, stick with us. Our conversation on the new space race continues after the break.
<laughs> Welcome back. When it comes to space dominance, Russia was hoping to take the lead. But last month, the country's Luna 25 mission failed. The rocket crashed into the moon during a landing attempt. It was Russia's first moon mission in 47 years. Tonight, we are joined by Dr. Mochtaba Akavantafti from the University of Michigan, as well as our residence resident science guy, Ahmed Badji, <laughs> who just loves to participate in these kinds of conversations. Ready for it. So, Mochtab, if you could start by telling us your area of expertise. It's fascinating what you study. Yeah, so thank you for having me. Um, I study space weather and what we call also magnetospheric physics and solar physics. Okay. Uh, magnetospheric physics really focuses on this magnetic shield that we have around our planet that shields us from everything other than light that comes off the sun. Uh, which is a lot of charged particles and, and magnetic fields. Um, and, and in addition to that, um, there's this new topic of space debris that, that we study at the University of Michigan um, that is really focused on, it's a very exciting that we're all going to space so much, but who's taking care of everything that we're leaving behind because not much of it is coming back unless you're at a very low Earth orbit. So that's, that's really the focus of what I study. And you've Michigan. been studying some of this, can I call it space junk, is what it sounds that's like? That's exactly what it is. <laughs> okay. <Yeah. laughs> so it's brought down, and you guys are, are doing what with it? So, no, actually, the, the majority of the space debris is, is stuff that goes to the lower Earth orbit. Those okay. are some of the communication satellites, um, and, and many of these um, SpaceX satellites are, are good examples of it. Those that are on the lower Earth orbit uh, very comfortably return back to the atmosphere and just burn the atmosphere once they retire. Sure. Those are that are farther away from our planet, um, especially at this orbit that is um, called geosynchronous orbit. That's the orbit where um, satellites can simply just sit there and park um, so that they can um, directly look at a very certain location on the ground. Um, those are very, very um, attractive to, to many of the communication satellites, but also spy satellites and, and um, other, other types of um, satellites because they can simply just park there. They don't have to burn much fuel, and they rotate around the same um, orbit as, as Earth. So they're always there. Um, and once you put a satellite there and you don't have fuel to get back and burn it out in the atmosphere, then you're just simply leaving many, um, the, your satellite out and that, at that orbit. Um, and over time, just like anything on Earth, um, the sun, sunshine is, is exposing the paint chips and everything else. And over time, we have a lot of trash in, in, huh. in orbit that we haven't taken care of in a long time. Well, even just looking at, I've got an active mapping up right now, just showing a lot of the active uh, satellites currently in orbit, the ones that are active at the moment. I mean, that's 8,500 satellites currently active. And you were talking about, obviously, the geostationary ones just about 500 or so of those, but I mean, the majority of them, like you were saying, were in low Earth orbit. And I mean, for the fact that there's, what was it, 7,700 or so currently active, and then those that aren't, I mean, that's a lot of stuff to try and navigate around. That, that is exactly right. And those are satellites. Mm -hmm. um, there are many other objects in space that we, we can, um, so Air Force can measure objects that are larger than four inches in, in diameter. Anything smaller right now, we can't, we don't even know how many of them there are. There are estimates that there are up to uh, hundreds of millions of debris that are down to one millimeter in size. So wow. even like maybe like a small little screw left over from Apollo That's or something. That's exactly right. Um, so, and everything in, in orbit moves at speeds up to seven uh, miles per hour. Um, sorry, seven um, kilometers per second, which in, in other words, that's three time, 30 times faster than the speed of sound. Wow. So think about that, even a little softball um, can can feel like a hitting a bus because it's moving so so fast. Wow. And those are the type of objects that our satellites, our astronauts, everyone has to go through to get to the orbits that they want. Um, and that's why you know the space station, for example, is such a good investment to really understand the type of environment that we're exposing our astronauts to, um, and and farther out as we go to the moon and later aim for the for Mars. Yeah. Really, what what type of environment are we looking at? So let's talk about that. Important to keep space clean yeah. and easy to navigate <laughs> as there is this new space race going on. We just talked about it with um, our, our last guest for a moment, but uh, describe where we are, where the U.S. is right now, and what are you most excited about in this current space race? Yeah. Um, so the space race. It started in the 60s, um, and and U.S. was really determined to get to the moon and, and put the first person on the moon. Um, and, and the mission was very clear up front that 
by the end of the decade, one man is going to be on the moon and, and return safely back home. And that's exactly what we achieved. However, it was a one-time thing. Um, very early in the 70s, the whole program pretty much dwindled because you know, um, the American um, public lost interest. Um, because there was a you know, good, good amount of um, public funds going to NASA to support um, the Apollo mission. So it's, it's very exciting to see that some of that interest is back, uh, partly because you know, other nations are now involved. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know, the, the latest Japanese and um, Indian missions that, that uh, one just landed and the other is, is on its way are good examples of why other nations are also interested. They're because there are the resources out there. Um, and the resources, just like Bill uh, mentioned earlier, are really what allows us to have a base um, so that we can operate in space, so that we can reduce some of our costs for, you know, you don't have to take typically, on average, 75% of your entire mass going to space is just fuel. Hmm. So if you could avoid some of that, that, that saves a lot of cost. So it's really exciting to see some of this is happening um, on the side of the governments. But really what excites me is, is bigger than that. So something that NASA has begun um, for the past few decades is, is this public-private partnership, where they're bringing a lot of companies to support so much of the activities that NASA works on. And you know, the, the way to get to space, um, what to do one, once in space, how to communicate in space, because you know, those are very critical issues that, be, that have to be addressed for us to um, be present in space. Um, and, and this really, this public partner, uh, private partnership is something that is unique um, that, that NASA has really started. And that allows us to reduce our operational costs significantly so that NASA can focus on their mission to explore. And then once they're comfortable with the topic, then they hand it over to the private sector so that they can um, make business out of it and create opportunities on Earth. And the Topic now has come up a couple of times just this evening then, talking about like the moon being the stepping stone to going further, trying to create a base there for extended stay, all that kind of stuff. Is that something that really has a chance to happen e either in this decade or even in our lifetimes? Or is that something that's going to take a while to get to? How close or how, I mean, easy is probably the wrong word to use for yeah, that, yeah. but how possible is that with the technology that we've currently got on hand? Mm -hmm. So we definitely have the, so much of the technology already in place. Um, in order for us to definitely, we've already been to, to the moon and we're gonna go back there, um, hopefully by the end of this decade. Uh, but that's, that's really only, just like we have the, Interna the International Space Station, um, only 100 miles from, from Earth. Think, when you think about the moon, that's, that's a completely different environment, the space environment. Um, so there you have a lot more radiation that you, the astronauts are going to be exposed to. The space debris I was just talking about, we, we have no idea what, what type of you know, objects, we're, objects we're dealing with. So it's, it's more than just having the technology to get to a place. You also have to understand how it's going to impact your, your satellites, your assets, and, and your, your human um, astronauts. Um, so we, we definitely have the capability, um, and uh, um, by, by the end of the decade, the, the idea right now at NASA is that uh, we're going to go back to the moon. We're going to, and, and the mission for NASA right now is just like JFK said back in the day that we're going to have a man on the moon and bring him back safely. Right now, the mission is that by the end of the decade, we're going to have a woman and a person of color on the moon mm -hmm. um, and, and create what we never were able to in the past to create sustainable operations on the moon. Because so that it just like in the early 70s that Apollo mission, you know, completely um, dwindled, this time we have a sustaining mission that continues to do exactly what the ISS is doing here on Earth. Just fascinating. We are going to continue our conversation on the space race after the break.
Welcome back. Dr. Mojtaba Akvantafti and Ahmed Badji, our next weather meteorologist, <laughs> still with us tonight. And we're talking about the latest space race, looking for resources on the moon. But we have a number of countries involved, and even within the United States, a number of different entities involved. Uh, what can you tell us about, it's not just NASA, but we've seen space tourism starting with private companies. Yeah. Who all is involved in this? Yeah, so when you think about NASA's mission to get us to, for example, the moon. It's not just about getting there. It's about understanding how to get there, understanding how to sustain there, and mm -hmm. understanding how to make bases there and, and do manufacturing or fuel, um, all of those. Um, and in order for us to understand all of this, we need to explore step by step all of the different components. And, and NASA typically um, takes care of the exploration part. And then once we have enough knowledge, then they pass it on to the commercial sector so that they can make, you know, um, if it makes um, economic sense, they, they make a business plan and you have new companies formed. Sure. Um, and so space tourism is, is, is another example of trying to make getting to space more affordable because it's, it's great that, you know, there is commercial interest. It's great that people are interested in putting their money um, and every, interest in general is good for, for our industry because more interest means more funding and that means more support for, for all of the other activities that are happening. Sure. So when, when we go after space tourism, simply the, the idea of safe um, you know, launch from Earth to, to orbit is something that if we can reduce cost significantly, which over the past decade, it's the, the reduction has been quite exponential. Um, this is only good because that allows us to then next think about the next step, uh, farther from Earth, and and then later on about you know more than just just getting to space. Then, what does it feel like to or what is required of staying in space, and and eventually living there? It's evolving. And see, I mean, these different private companies, obviously, some of them using that reusable hardware for you know for lack of a better phrase yeah. with it. But I mean, you've got the next Artemis mission coming up at the end of next year. So we're just about a year away from that with a uh, Michigander, native Michigander, Christina Koch, who's involved in that, one of the astronauts on the mission. But they use, we were just talking during the break, the SLS. Yeah. Um, uh, so is, and is that something, the, these NASA rockets, is that something that you see eventually going away and shifting completely over then? To this and becoming reusable then or is that something NASA is going to do on their own? Yeah so SLS really um, if, if I understand correctly SLS is designed for getting us to the, to, to Mars um, and so and, and there are many space companies involved in, in figuring out how to get us to the moon so that NASA can focus on the bigger and brighter thing for the future. Um, so yes I if, if my understanding is correct um, the focus of, of the community is for NASA to, to take the first step, um, show the viability, and then companies that are doing that, that there's a whole list of them that whose, whose mission is to really get us cheaply to space. Um, and oftentimes, they need to be reusable for it to make economic sense. Um, and that's, so I think, the future of um, the space system is going to be reusable rockets. Okay. Is there one particular private company that you're excited about that you're seeing do something that's really interesting? Yeah, so um, there are many companies right now that, um, so just just quickly going back to the topic of getting to the moon. Mm -hmm. So we just learned that, you know, um, India and Japan have, have their probes going. But at the same time, later this month or this year, there are two American companies going to, to the moon to land also. So just let that sink for a second that, you know, NASA got to the moon, put people on, um, on, on the surface of the moon in the 60s. Mm -hmm. Now the co American companies are going there. So this, this is really the result of that private um, public partnership that I was talking about earlier. So what's, what's really exciting about these companies is that they're, they're helping us figuring out a cheaper way of getting to space, which right now there, there are many um, satellites that are being built for those missions because we have the launch capability now that is cheap, affordable, therefore it's really making new businesses form because for the first time we have what it takes to start, for example, a communication satellite company. Um, it, we're trying to figure out how to do 3D printing in space, hmm. how to make fuel in space, and every single one of these steps is trying to f 
enable us to be more present in the space over time. And companies are a core part of that that plan forward. There must be some level of oversight, though, right? Like if these private companies, you know, say they make it to the, you know. I guess my question is, can we trust these private companies that's, that's to be on the great, leading edge of space science? That is that is a great question, and I hope that my takeaway message tonight is is that it's it's wonderful to see how much progress is happening in space, um, and and these private public partnerships and new governments trying to go to space. This is these are all good good progress, and in so many ways, this is more than just a space race. This more more of a um, you can call it a relay competition where, for example, what India learns about the, the south side of um, or the southern lobe of uh, moon, they're going to share the information. And NASA's involved with most of these missions, mm -hmm. um, and especially or the one going to the sun, um, all of those NASA's helping them. There is this idea of um, the Artemis mission is part of what we call the Artemis Accord. And that's really a set of criteria for how to play fairly and peacefully in space. And many, many nations have already signed on to this. It's simply about transparency, sharing resources, sharing science, and, and many other factors. Um, and there are other, other countries that haven't still joined that. Um, and, and they have their own plan, plans for you know, involving other co countries to, to go together to, to the moon and later on to Mars. However, when you look at glo global effort into uh, around getting to space. The space laws are very thin and, and not, not really very reliable. And that's, so the one thing that really needs to be around all of these, it goes back to your com comment about can you trust players? Because you know, there is, human greed is not going anywhere. And this, we call this the final frontier. And you know, because right now, the competition, there are, the superpowers that are going to space. Mm -hmm. But there's a good chance, we, because we've done it in the past, and right now you see the race to regulate AI, for example, is because you know we did not do it until now we're trying to catch up. And right now we're dealing, we're at a time when space is really exponentially growing and, and growing very, very quickly. We either put these laws in place by the superpowers to stick to so that future players can also play with the same rules. Because we're excited that there are no borders outside once you leave Earth. But Bill was talking about this earlier. You don't know what a superpower is going to do or a bad actor is going to do if they're the first on a, on a new planet, on a new body. Are they going to claim the whole thing or, or what is going to happen? And then another example is the space debris I was talking about earlier. The, the laws around you being responsible for what you take to space and returning it is, is still very slim. We don't really do much about some of, some of these activities. And there have been tests where um, sending or trying to test what it's like to get rid of a spacecraft by simply exploding the spacecraft. And that just exponentially increases the number of space debris. And there have been, I think, three of those tests uh, for wow. the past few decades. So these are some of irresponsible activities that are happening, and partly it's because we don't really have many strong laws around this. So at the moment, it's kind of the opposite of the National Parks rule of whatever you bring in, you take back out. Right now, it's whatever goes up there, it's there. Yeah. Uh, maybe we actually, blow it up, maybe not. Yeah, maybe blow it up. <laughs> well, that's, that's, that's the worst solution, because yeah. that only increases the number of space debris. So right now, you can at least keep track of a retired satellite. But if you blow it up, then you have many small objects, and each are, are like sharp now, going, going at those yeah. very high velocities right through your spacecraft and destroy, destroy life, assets, and, and others. Wow, incredibly yeah. interesting. Thank you so much for joining yeah. us today. Of this course. is Dr. Yes. Mojtaba <laughs> Akvan Tafti, a climate and space research scientist with the University of Michigan. Your expertise is just fascinating. We're yeah. glad we have smart people like you working on all <laughs> of this. Thank you very much for Thanks having for joining me. Thanks for joining us. Of course. Appreciate your time. And as we end our space conversation today, it marks 31 years since Mae Jemison became the first black woman in space. The astronaut, doctor, and engineer was a mission specialist on the endeavor in 1992.